Hi, I'm Darren Morton and welcome to Happiness by Design. In this episode, we explore the topic of food and mood. And we ask the question, does what we consume affect the way that we feel? Well, I imagine that anyone who has uh, slightly overdone it at one of those all-you-can-eat restaurants will concur that, yeah, what we consume can affect the way that we feel. And I thought to uh, help flesh out this concept, I have with me uh, Dr. Ross Grant. Welcome. Ross. Great to be here. Thanks, Dan. Now, Ross, you're presently uh, Director of the Australasian Research Institute. That's right, at Sydney Adventist Hospital. But your key area of research and, and interest, I suppose, is biochemistry. Yeah, well, one of the areas that we spend a fair bit of time in is, is um, particularly the role of, or one of the large projects is particularly the role of, of food and certain types of food on the development of mood and particularly tending towards depression. Well, we got the right man for the show, didn't we? Well, I hope so. Um, we can offer a little bit. Well, Ross, I would like to prepare for you a meal. Does that excite you? Fantastic. Yeah, Great I thought idea. it would. I thought it would. Now, I've got some... Um, this is my little uh, food container here, and, and here is yours. I might just go first, if you don't mind. Yeah. So, um, hands are clean. I'm just the guest. Hands are clean. You are just the guest. <laughs> All right, so I'm just, I've actually got a little bit of uh, cucumber there for myself. A little bit of tomato, just pop that in there. Got some carrot sticks. Carrot yeah. sticks are good, you like yeah, carrot sticks? Yeah, looking nice and fresh, vitamin yeah. A is good there. for you. Yeah, it's nice, nice. A yeah. little bit of uh, lettuce in there. Good oh, roughage. Why not? Hey, I'm going to overdo it today. Look, let's go. Go the whole hog. Hard to overdo it. All right. Just... You know what? I'm just going to put it all in there. I'm really, I'm quite sort of ravenous. So there we go. Let's just pop that in there like this. My plate is clean. I'll give that a bit of a stir. You know what? I think that looks pretty good. That looks pretty good. Pretty good. All right. Well, your turn. Okay. Don't do a thing. Now, I thought, you know, I actually want to go the extra mile here. I thought that uh, instead of just, you know, prepare, you know, giving you the food, I've even uh, saved you the trouble of chewing too much. So I've sort of diced it up. You know, got it down a, a bit, uh, bit smaller. So let's. Uh, here we go with your your meal. You're a good bloke, First of all, Darren. pie. First of all, yeah. pie. You like pie? Uh, well, certain types of pies it's are pretty good. Nut meat variety is it? Nut meat variety. Um, yeah. All right, we'll see how we go. Here, excuse yeah, hands, tell me what's mate. in that one. Excuse hands. They're clean hands. Yeah, they? they are, yep. So here we go. Let's just pop the pie in your little uh, in your little tucker bag there. Nice. Chips. We need some chips to cap chips. that off. Chips, well, you fact, know. They're going to be a bit crunchy if you try and swallow them, so I'll just get them into uh, really a more good. palatable state. Yeah, your hands are definitely clean now. Yes. Well, they are now. Yeah. They are now. So here we go, we're getting our chips, a couple more. Now, after something like that, you need, you know, that's, you're going to be a bit dry, I would imagine, after that, so... You're not going to put those other two chips in? Sorry. In, no, we'll save them for Sorry. later. Ice cream? Ice cream's good. Ice cream yeah. is good. Let's just pour that on in. Nice. And one tub is hardly ever enough, is it? No. So let's go one more. Then we'll Can I help on. you with this one? Yeah, chocolate put topping. the chocky sauce on top. I'm the guest, so I can put as much you as I can, like, can't that's I? That's it. It's, uh, it, you... would, it would be rude to say I'm not allowed to have. Knock yourself out. Nice. That's beautiful. Yeah. That's All right. Well, let's give that a bit of a stir. All right. Here we go. Beautiful. Let's have a look here. Let's just move mine out of the way. That's looking looking pretty good, I think. Although I would imagine after a after a feed like that, you're going to be a bit parched, aren't you? You're going to need a a bit of something to wash it down. Well, I can probably say I'm not very hungry anymore. But... Uh, really? <laughs> yeah. I can't yeah. understand that for a moment. How about we just give you a bit of cola, a bit of, uh, yeah. a bit of soft drink there. Nice. Nice bit of caffeine in that. And uh, that little puppy's starting to brew away quite nicely. Yeah. Yeah. I can just imagine what that's going to do. That's. Well, mate, you dig in. Okay. You should... Mm, well, maybe not. We can do it afterwards? We can do it if afterwards. that's okay with you, yeah. Now, Ross, when I look at something like this, it's fairly plain to, for me to see, and I'm imagining most people are the same, that this looks like the kind of meal that could uh, foster vitality. It looks fairly alive to me, in fact. This one here, I'm not quite sure about. In fact, I sort of have an understanding now as to why when we consume those kind of uh, nutrients, if we could call them that, uh, leave us feeling a little, little bit ordinary. Mm. What I thought might be fun is, and I obviously have a bit of a background in physiology, yours is in biochemistry. I thought what we might do is, is trace the journey of a meal like that through our system Sounds and good. how it may actually influence the way that we feel. Mm -hmm. And so to do that, I'm going to uh, call on the, the services of our resident model, uh, Fred the Half Head. But we're not going to just look at his head today, we're going to look at his whole body. So mm -hmm. let me bring him up. All right. Sounds good. All right, Freds, don't be shy. Let's move our 
drink away on some. Right, now Fred uh, located here is uh, we're going to just remove a couple of parts so we can see the most important things. So here's his rib cage and his lungs. We'll take them out of his way. He's just had a he's, heart attack. He's yeah. just had a heart attack. Let's just drop that out of the way. Um, let's remove this big organ here, which is the liver. And now we can see something that well, I suppose will be the first port of call for our little, uh, our little meal here. Yeah. In fact, I, let me ask you a question even before that. Our mood state can often be influenced by not what we eat, but not eating at all. Yeah, I mean, <clears throat> when we're particularly hungry, we've got some fantastic things that go on in the body. And most people wouldn't know that the actual stomach produces a... So this is the stomach this here? This is the stomach this here. This J-shorp yep, shaped just what organ. You feel down here. So this stomach here actually produces some molecules which go into the blood and then go up into the brain. We won't pull the brain apart, but this actually tells the brain, hey, you're hungry. So you start focusing then on, I've got to get something to eat. Right. It's a little molecule called ghrelin, which is interesting. I don't like ghrelin very much. Yeah, so. well, it keeps us alive, because then we know that our body's running out of energy so that we need to fill it. Right. So it's good in a sense, but uh, yeah, some people, you're not going to feel so good yes. when, when you've got lots of ghrelin there because you're focused on just getting food. So right. yeah, you feel a little bit less happy, probably. Right, so okay, so from word go, we, when we're not consuming enough, mm -hmm. we feel like we want some, yep. and, and that's um, and we're wired that way. That's yeah. quite, quite simple. Yeah. And so we, we gravitate towards some food. Yeah. Now I'm looking over at our little uh, little contraption over here. This is this is good. And, uh, and it is, I, I find it quite fascinating that to look at that, there's no one that I know that would eat that. But we're quite happy to do one ingredient at a time, isn't it? Yeah, so, that's right. So let's uh, anyway. We've now consumed uh, this particular meal. It's going to go in Fred's head, mm -hmm. his mouth, chew it up comes down his esophagus, all the way down, pops through this little uh, muscle, very fine band here, the, uh, the diaphragm, diaphragm yeah. and we're into the, uh, into the stomach. That's now, it. once it's in the stomach, there's, there's an intriguing thing happening because what often happens is that people seem to overeat in the first instance if they're very hungry. Mm. And um, I understand that it takes, what, sort of 10 or 20 minutes before our brain registers that, hey, I'm full now. That we've already got food in there, yeah. And in 10 or 20 minutes, we can consume quite a lot. And most people have got a lot of food in front of them, and so they do tend to consume a fair bit, particularly if they think it tastes nice. Right, mm. and so this is the reason why we often overeat, isn't it? Yeah, that's right. I mean, yeah, that's right, in the early stages. But then, you know, you get that swelling of the stomach and you start to feel uncomfortable because yes. now the body's starting to say, hey, you've got too much in there. Yes, yes. And so, one, that's working against us, I suppose, yep. is that we tend to eat t food too fast. Too quickly, yeah. Uh, but not only that, I understand that the, the nutrients within the meal can actually affect what's going to happen in the stomach as well. And I think we can open up Fred's stomach here. Yeah, I should just point out too, one of the reasons why we probably eat too much too quickly is because we don't have to chew the food very much either. All of that food that you nicely digested for me, or yes. at least cut up for me before I ate it, you could really down that without chewing it very much. Whereas a lot of the foods which are in their more natural state, you've got to chew a lot more. Yes. And so it actually fills the stomach a lot more slowly. Yes. But yeah, now it, once it gets into here, now, I'm, I'm intrigued in the role that fats can actually, the role they can play in our feeling of fullness or over fullness, mm, if yeah. you like. Let's, uh, I'll ask you more about that just after the mm. break. Don't go away. Welcome back. And before the break, Ross, we, we mentioned that fats, a fatty meal like this little one here, mm -hmm. can actually make us feel full and overfull mm -hmm. in a more potent way. Mm. And that sort of, I suppose, occurs from both a biochemical level and a physiological one. Yeah. What's the biochemistry then? Yeah, well, in the same way that the stomach will produce that molecule ghrelin, which tells us that we're hungry, yes. it will also produce another molecule once you start having enough fats in there or enough, car uh, you know, uh, energy dense foods in there, it'll produce another molecule which goes back and tells the brain, hey, you've had enough, slow down, stop eating. Right. And that would work well if we were filling the stump, stomach a little more slowly. Right. And so fats are a very powerful promoter of that, of the production it is, of that. Yeah, yeah, it's more powerful than, than the carbohydrates, which is more powerful than the proteins. Right. Mm. So that's one way. Now, from a physiological perspective, what we know is that obviously the journey of this meal after it's in your stomach is to move next into, and I'll just pop the small intestine, excuse me, Fred, take the large intestine there. This is the small intestine, around 22 feet of it. 
rather a lengthy little organ. But um, from the stomach, it's now moving into the first part of the small intestine mm. called the duodenum. And um, now fat, when it moves into the small intestine, there's an interesting little um, story that goes on with this, this, this sphincter, isn't it? The pyloric sphincter. Mm. Yeah, which leads muscle at the end of the The stomach. muscle at the end yeah. of the stomach. What happens to that, um, that pyloric sphincter when there's fatty materials that move into the small intestine. Yeah, it seems not to work quite as efficiently, so it doesn't open up, allowing the rest of the stomach to empty. Right. So the stomach, in a sense, I guess, stays fuller for longer. So here's another reason why a fatty meal could make us feel mm. a bit bloated. Mm. In fact, I, I should share the, the story. I, uh, I remember I was having a, delivering a lecture on this topic to some of my students at Avondale College on one occasion. One of the students, just for no apparent reason, in the middle of this lecture, stands up all excited about this concept. It seems like he had some kind of epiphany and, and he, he cups his hands and he says, so wait a minute, what you're saying to me is that like a, if I have a fatty meal, like a, a fatty, you know, potato or, you know, covered in oil and cheese, he says it slides on down and then goes, ooh in the bottom of my stomach and uh, I sort of looked at this guy and I thought, well, that's probably a good descriptor of what yeah, goes on. He's obviously listening. So yeah. it's, that, it's that little, that sphincter, that pyloric sphincter, that muscle that shuts down, yep. shuts slows, down opens it up. emptying from the stomach yep. and makes us feel full longer. Yeah, that's right. While we're talking about the stomach, this particular meal that I prepared for you and for your enjoyment yes. had some caffeine in there. Yeah. Caffeine, right. Where, what's its story? How yeah, can it caffeine. Can affect how we feel. Yeah, and it can affect how we feel. So, caffeine, as you know, comes in a lot of the colas and things like that. And uh, this has, a, has an effect on actually a number of different organs of the body, but most people have it because of its effect on the brain. Mm. Because it gives us a short term feel good. So, mm. we actually feel a little bit good after we've had caffeine, about 20 or 30 minutes after we've, we've taken it in. The unfortunate thing with caffeine is that it also has an effect on some of the other parts of the body. It actually switches off all of our cells, and this is a, a little bit of a difficult one to understand, I guess, but all of our cells have a switch on them. So that when the cell is running out of energy, the switch turns things off so that the, the cell stops working so hard. Right. What caffeine does is come along and actually mask that switch. So instead of the cell recognising that it's actually running out of energy, it thinks, no, fine, I've got heaps of energy. Right. So it keeps going, and that's why you feel pretty good for a while. Mm. But unfortunately, you'll go along good for a while and then crash. So it's trying to run on resources it doesn't have. It doesn't have. You're running right. on empty. And unfortunately, it also, and this is well known, that caffeine, particularly taking, you know, uh, uh, four or more, three or four uh, say if it was cups of coffee or something like that or the equivalent mm. uh, a day, will also increase what we call the stress response. Right. And increased stress response increases sort of anxiety. Yes. And that is one of the most foundational underpinners for the development of depression. Right. So in the short term makes you feel good, but in the long term has the possibility of making you actually feel quite bad. Right, this is interesting. So now you talk about that high you can get yep. from sometimes certain nutrients we consume yep. or chemicals we consume and but then it can result in a low yep, that's and right. certainly um, you know we hear about carbohydrates a lot mm. and the role that they can play in that and um, can we just talk a little bit then so you know if we follow the journey of our meal that's f there's a fair bit of carbohydrates lots in there, of so carbohydrates in there yep. so moving out of the stomach moves into the small intestine and, yep. and it's within this you know 22 feet seven sort of meters yep. or so of, of, of small intestine that the bulk of absorption of the nutrients takes place yeah. um, the type of the carbohydrate the type of the yeah. sugars that we have can actually cause these spikes of energy up and down yep. too can't they yeah they, they sure can. can you tell us about that yeah well if you have a look at the difference between these two what's in here you've got carbohydrate too, but there are lots of sort of glucose molecules, if you like, all the sugar molecules, all attached to each other. Right. So the body's got to break them down yes. before they can be absorbed. And it takes a while to break them down, so when it gets absorbed, it's getting absorbed slowly. Right. And so it goes into the body slowly, and then the body deals with it, and I'll talk about that in a second. Yes. But when we take a hit like this, a hit like that. I like uh, the way you put that. Yeah, no, it's, it's pretty good. It's a good hit. It's Most starting of to br foam, bubble there. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I think it's fermenting. But um, bacteria are probably enjoying it now. But when you've got something like this, there is so much simple carbohydrates, so simple sugars. So the body doesn't need to break it down. It just gets absorbed straight away. So you get this really 
big spike of sugar going across into the bloodstream. Right. And the body needs to be able to handle that because, and most people won't know this either, that there is, when sugar goes high, like the same sort of thing, if you spilt sugar on the bench here, it would get sticky after a while. Yes. Well, if you have too much sugar floating around in the blood, it actually causes a lot of things to get sticky. Right. And if they get too sticky, they can clog up little arteries and little blood vessels, and that causes lots of problems, which is pardon me, why people with diabetes yes. end up with some of those medical problems. Yes. So you don't want it to go high. So the body actually has a system of being able to get that, all that glucose into the cells, yes. which is what it tries to do, and it uses the pancreas to do that, to produce a molecule called insulin. insulin. And most people recognise that this is the problem with diabetics. They don't have enough insulin generally. So, so what you're saying to me then is that this kind of a meal, the, the types of sugars or carbohydrates contained mm -hmm. in this meal, a more steady and yep. uh, and, and more long-lasting energy. Yeah, that's Whereas right. this kind, or a candy bar, might give us the old that's right bit of a punch for a while, but a then we come down. Yeah, and we crash for two reasons. One is that uh, yes, we've got this hit, but then the insulin actually then pumps up lots of it out there, and so it gets the big spike down, yes. but usually there's too much insulin around at that point, and so we go from normal level, then we drop down Way even down further, so, so we actually have a, a low. Right. And those sugars that are the long lasting ones we refer to as, as high, sorry, low glycemic index. Low it? glycemic index, that's, that's right. Whereas these are high. High glycemic index. Okay, we're talking yeah. about some food and mood. Um, got some more questions for you. Don't go away, join us after the break. Hi, and welcome back. Now, Ross, we've been contrasting, uh, we're following the journey of a meal like this, if we can call it a meal, on its way through uh, through the system and how it can influence the way that we feel mm. in our mood state. When I contrast two meals like this, it occurs to me that this one here, with our pie and chips and soft drink, has a lot greater energy density than mm. something like that. What do we mean by energy density? Yeah, well, of course, the reason why we eat is because we need to replace the energy that we're burning up by doing whatever we're doing, you know, exercising, whatever. So we need to be able to replace that energy and we get that only from food. When we take in foods like this, it has a lot of, you know, those simple carbohydrates, lots of fats in there and the fats themselves you know, as, as uh, we were saying before, about two and a half times the density of energy. So it's got much more energy right. per weight. So is that a good thing? Does that make us feel more energetic though? Yeah, well, in the first instance, no, right. because actually, particularly with the fats, it's got to convert that fat into energy. Right. So it actually takes a lot of resources to actually make that into right. energy. So that's why fatty meals, we don't feel... You, you, you won't don't feel that <laughs> energetic, it's more like usually. A, uh, uh, yeah, yeah. Kind of thing. Uh, you really feel like going and having a sleep. Yeah. There's some problems with that too, but yes. I guess we haven't got time. Yeah. But, um, so this one gets a lot of energy in there. Yes, ultimately we convert that if we've already got enough energy elsewhere, we'll actually convert that either into the glucose yeah. and therefore used in the cells or we'll convert it into fats if we've got too much uh, energy there yeah. and then those fats will be laid down around the body. Right, so, and that's not exactly what we're after, is it? I mean, I think I'm just reading a report the other day, you know, in many Western cultures, but Australia being one, uh, westernised the majority of the adult population are overweight or obese so yeah. i'm assuming that there's another good reason and generally we don't feel as good about ourselves when we are sort of carrying extra kilos and we say here's probably another reason why a meal like this long term can contribute to us not feeling so good yeah i want to pick up on one last point and that is the water content mm. of these two meals and this mm. is a bit i mean we, we poured some fluids in here so it looks mm -hmm. a bit runny but Generally, these type of foods, these processed foods, don't have the same sort of water content mm. as these ones. And, and hydration, obviously, is a, a imperative to a very important um, element of, of how we feel. Mm, absolutely. Some of the, the functions of water within the body. Yeah, water is so critical. And, and most people will learn from their high school biology that we're about 70% water, which mm. is true. Mm. And water is necessary not only for transporting things around, so in the blood, the blood's actually quite watery, uh, that transports all of our nutrients to all the different tissues and it also transports away from them a lot of the wastes that those cells from all the parts of the body need to get out of the body. Mm. And as all everybody would know is that 
when you pass it out through the kidneys and out through the urine, that's all watery. Mm. So if you don't have enough water, you actually can't flush the system anywhere near as efficiently. So yes. you're left with all of these toxic substances staying around in the body. Mm. And that affects the way we feel. Mm. Absolutely. So how much water do we need then? I yeah, mean... that's, that's a good question. And it really depends on you know, whether or not you're an indoor worker or an outdoor worker. Mm. I mean, poor people talk about four to six glasses a day, mm. um, but it really does depend. You really need to be able to probably drink a little bit more than you feel you need to. Yeah. Starting off the day that way and then just keeping hydrated throughout the day. Now, it, it, it's true, isn't it, that the, in humans, the, the drive to drink that is thirst mm -hmm. is actually quite a poor indicator mm. of our hydration status, isn't it? So mm. by the time we actually feel thirsty, we're usually, you know, we can be up to sort of two, the equivalent of two cups down. Mm. So, you know, the importance mm. of, of drinking. You mentioned before that water is, uh, is a, an important part of the blood. Mm -hmm. um, now, blood, um, we have this term viscosity. Mm -hmm. You know, so when we talk about when people are dehydrated, that it can actually change this viscosity of the blood. What, what do we mean by viscosity? Yeah, viscosity just means how thick it is. Right. So the water out of the tap is a lot lower viscosity than honey, for example. Right. So, so when you don't have enough water in the blood, then it tends to get more, it just, just tends to get thicker. Yes. So if it's not flowing so easily yes. through the body, and there's lots of very tiny, small capillaries and veins that it's got to flow through. Yes. If it's thick as it tries to get through there, it's not going to be as an efficient uh, way of being able to, again, transport the important things, even like oxygen and things like that. But also, it may also cause some occlusion, so you may actually get right. some of the small vessels blocked up. And I imagine the load on the heart trying to circulate, I mean you use the example of honey and water, mm. when blood is thick and viscous the, mm. it, it's a lot more taxing on it. And, and yeah. it was actually interesting in the Adventist Health Study, uh, they actually found that um, people, one of the, the key predictors of people um, experiencing heart attacks was their hydration status. Mm. And, um, and that when, they, when they fleshed out those results, it's, for example, it's well established that people tend to experience heart attacks between about 6 a.m. and 9 a.m. in the morning. Mm -hmm. And the reason for that is we're mm -hmm. obviously most dehydrated at mm. that point in time, aren't we? Mm. So how, how, okay, so we should endeavour to drink more. Yeah. And it's consistently, I hear people when they try and do that, say they feel better for it. Yeah. Um, how do you know when you're hydrated? Yeah, I mean, as I was mentioning before, the way the body actually cleans all of the things out of the body, all the, all the uh, toxins and metabolites and that, it actually goes out through the kidney and out through the urine. So one of the easiest ways to tell is to see, one, how often you go into the toilet, mm. and two, what the colour of your urine is. If it's sort of really yellow, you could probably say, well, I need a bit more water. It's actually, I, I have a little anecdote that I use for my students in, when they ask me that very question, and I like your answer there. I tell them that um, you know you're, you're well hydrated, held, you know that you're well hydrated if you're a frequent flyer, as in zip zip, and, uh, and I always tell them, don't go for the gold. You know, if you're achieving the gold, it's only one endeavour in life. Don't go for the gold. Yeah, yeah, no, that's true. It should be light coloured, shouldn't it? It should. Yeah, almost clear. Ross, when I reflect on this, I, I was interested, I was reading a book um, in Defence of Food by Michael Pollan, and uh, he makes this comment. He said that essentially um, we shouldn't consume too many of the foods that weren't available to our great great grandmother. Mm. Yeah. And essentially what, what he's saying is that, you know, when it comes to nutrition, it's the, the oldies that, the, that are the goldies. And, yeah. and would, it be, would it be fair to say that um, biochemists in all their wisdom haven't come close to being able to design a food that even matches the health promoting benefits of, say, a simple whole grain or a you know, simple piece of fruit or the, or the veggies? Yeah, that's, that's absolutely true. And one of the interesting things that we're finding out about these sort of foods now is that it's not just the carbohydrates and proteins and sugars that food gives us. These kind of foods with the fresh fruit and the veggies and that sort of stuff have some of these other things, what we call adjunct nutrients, and which really do good things to the body. Absolutely. You know, and that should come as no surprise to us. You know, mm. We were designed to function like that, mm. weren't we? Yeah, absolutely. I'm Darren Morton reminding you to delight in God's design.